Number 9. Soviet T-34-76 Tanks The T-34 was introduced in 1940. It's a medium-sized Soviet tank that became famous for its use by the Red Army during Operation Barbarossa. It quickly earned a reputation for its superiority against German tanks, with some Nazi leaders even admitting that they knew it was better. And since there's no reason to fix something that's not broken, the T-34 remained mostly unchanged throughout the war. The first major upgrades were made in 1944. Several other countries have used the T-34, including Angola, Yugoslavia, Egypt, Afghanistan, China, and others. Consequently, there are numerous abandoned T-34 tanks throughout the world. Some are occasionally still being found, like this T-34 that was pulled from the bottom of the Don River in Russia's Voronezh region in 2016. One of the most iconic abandoned T-34 tanks, nicknamed Stompy, can be found in London, where it's routinely painted over by graffiti artists. The vehicle was originally used by the Czech Army. It was decommissioned and sold following the dissolution of Czechoslovakia. From there, the tank went to London, where it was used as a prop in the British film Richard III. After that, Russell Gray, a local scrap dealer, bought the T-34 as a gift for his son. But he ended up using it to get revenge against the local council, whom he was embroiled in an ongoing dispute with over their refusal to give him permission to redevelop a plot of land. Gray parked the vehicle on the property and positioned its gun's turret toward the council's offices. The council had previously approved his request to install a tank at the site, but they had assumed that Gray was referring to a specific tank in his application. Quite the mix-up there. It remains parked there to this day, where it's become a celebrated local fixture. After the pandemic hit, the tank was painted blue in support of England's National Health Service. It's since been painted light green, and it looks like it will undoubtedly change again at some point in the near future. Number 8. Muchalapka Near the Czech border in rural Poland, there's a massive concrete ten-sided structure nicknamed Hitler's Stonehenge. Also called Muchalapka, it was built by the Nazis during World War II, when this area was part of Germany. There's a series of secret underground tunnels that run beneath the structure. They were built between 1943 and 1945 as part of a secret project called Riza. Researchers don't know what the decagonal building was meant for or used for. Some speculate that it was intended as a missile launch site. Others think that it might be the unfinished base of a water cooling tower, while more imaginative individuals have suggested that it was a launching pad for UFOs or a time travel machine. Some of the more far-flung ideas build on conspiracy theories revolving around Hitler's death. For example, some people have gone as far as saying that Hitler didn't die, he simply boarded an acorn-shaped machine at the site and traveled to another dimension. It's easy to scoff at such a seemingly outlandish idea, but at the end of the day, even the experts are stumped when it comes to Muchalapka. Number 7. Lobitos Lobitos is a quiet surfing town on the Peruvian coast, and by quiet, we mean that it's mostly a ghost town. Only a handful of people live there, and it looks like the population suddenly got up and left one day. The town is filled with deserted military buildings and Victorian homes, as well as a hospital, a school, and a playground. Lobitos started out as a fishing town. At some point, it became a colony of the Lobitos Oilfield Company, which rented the land from the Peruvian government. Most of its residents were British and American employees of the company and their families. In fact, local Peruvians were banned from entering the town. The standard of living was much higher for the people who lived in Lobitos than it was elsewhere. It was even home to South America's first movie theater. When a military dictatorship took over the country in the year 1968, the government seized Lobitos and evicted its 20,000 residents, giving them just 10 days to leave. The Peruvian army turned the empty town into a base, using the vacant mansions to house its personnel. At the time, Peru and Ecuador were embroiled in a territorial dispute. Given its proximity to the border, Lobitos was an ideal place to establish the base. But the two countries soon reached a peace agreement and the base was removed. After the military left, the remaining buildings fell victim to vandals and the elements. Lobitos remained abandoned for decades until relatively recently, when surfers realized that they can catch excellent waves there. They began reclaiming the deserted town and bringing it back to life. But it's still mostly empty and its buildings are still largely in ruins. Number 6. Havor 51 Bunker Deep in the wilderness of the Birdie Mountains, the Havor 51 Bunker was built during the Cold War. After the Soviet military took it over in 1968, it became the most heavily guarded place in what was Czechoslovakia at the time. Czechs and Slovaks alike were banned from stepping foot into the property, and only certain members of the Soviet military were allowed there. Guards were ordered to shoot trespassers on sight, and even planes were prohibited from flying overhead. This is because the Soviets stored an arsenal of nuclear warheads and short-range missiles at the site. 
the stockpile was implemented as part of the Warsaw Pact, a collective defense treaty between the Soviet Union and seven of its satellite states that required its participants to prepare for a possible attack or defense strike from the Western Bloc. The underground complex was equipped with its own water source, power generator, and air filtration system. As power dynamics shifted in Czechoslovakia starting in the late 80s, the military presence in Berdy gradually decreased. Havor 51 was ultimately abandoned and was only recently opened to the public for the first time as the Atom Museum. Visitors can see some of the leftover tactical equipment and weapons, although the nuclear missiles are thankfully no longer there. Reaching the museum isn't exactly easy. A somewhat vague set of directions on its website instruct guests to travel down a narrow forest path and to not be discouraged by driving through the deep forest. Number 5. Bayantal. In the middle of the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, 19 miles from the nearest town lie the remains of Bayantal, a sprawling former Soviet airbase. A crumbling archway marks the entrance to the site, which contains barracks, aircraft hangars, monuments, old supply depots, an overgrown two-mile-long runway, and other decaying structures. The concrete is cracked, metal is rusting, and plant life has reclaimed spaces that were once reserved for humans. Bayantal looks slightly apocalyptic, as though it was abandoned much longer ago than it actually was. It operated between the 1970s and the 1990s as a first line of defense against a potential invasion from China. Like many other military bases, it closed when the Soviet Union fell. The doorways to the apartment buildings have mostly either been sealed off or blocked by deliberately collapsed staircases, making the interiors inaccessible. In 2013, a group of explorers managed to get into one of the buildings, where they found lots of garbage and evidence of fires left behind by past squatters. Old Soviet newspapers and layers of different wallpapers are among the few remnants left behind by past residents. Nomadic families are known to occasionally set up camp at Bayantal, where they live between rather than within the buildings as their cattle graze among the ruins. There are several other abandoned Soviet bases throughout Mongolia, including one in Choy Balsan. The areas surrounding these bases consisted largely of military personnel and their families. For example, after the Soviet Union collapsed, the local population at Choy Balsan dwindled from over 300,000 to around 39,000, turning entire neighborhoods into ghost towns. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Thanks for checking us out. What do you think so far? Let us know in the comments down below, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 4. Cape Schmidt Right across the Bering Strait from Alaska in the northeastern corner of Siberia, a collection of crumbling buildings and military equipment dot the desolate landscape. Built in 1954, the former Soviet military base at Cape Schmidt was largely abandoned when the Cold War ended during the 90s. In 1998, brutal winter conditions forced a thousand people to evacuate the region, causing the deserted base to fall even further into obscurity. Today, a small portion of it operates as a municipal airport for the local community, but the rest of the site has fallen into disrepair, with some parts becoming half buried in snow. In 2015, photographer Andre Chapron rode three and a half hours by helicopter to reach Cape Schmidt as part of a project documenting polar bear migration. The bears were running late, so he decided to explore the abandoned base while he waited for them to arrive. Chapron spent three weeks at Cape Schmidt, where he endured biting winds and increasingly short windows of daylight that lasted just a few hours at most. At first glance, the images he captured of decaying structures, long-forgotten vehicles, and other left-behind fixtures appear black and white. But it's not the photos that lack color, it's the scenery itself. Russia claims to have re-established a military presence at Cape Schmidt in recent years. The American Security Project, a nonprofit that keeps tabs on foreign military bases, noted on its website that as of 2015, the facilities at Cape Schmidt are being upgraded. But the exact nature of any future plans that Russia has for its activities there are a mystery. Number 3. Project Harp Space Gun During the late 1950s, the U.S. Department of Defense and the Canadian Department of National Defense collaborated to create a space gun that was capable of launching projectiles into the Earth's upper atmosphere. The initiative was called the High Altitude Research Project, or HARP for short. A Canadian ballistics engineer and mad scientist of sorts named Gerald Bull designed the weapon, which was made from a 65-foot-long, 16-inch wide naval cannon. It's the type of cannon that would typically be seen on a naval battleship, but instead the gun was installed on a hill along the Barbadian coast in the Caribbean. A tube was connected to the weapon, extending its length to over 130 feet, making it the largest piece of operational artillery in the world at the time. At this size, it was impractical for military use, but its creators hoped that it would be ideal for delivering satellites into orbit. The gun was capable of firing objects 112 miles into the sky. 
By 1965, it had shot over 100 items into the ionosphere. Around the same time, the U.S. military established several other HARP launch sites throughout the U.S. and Canada. In 1966, the project began to experience funding issues amid growing criticism and opposition from members of the Canadian government, which pulled out of the project the following year. The U.S. Army followed suit, ending the project for good, and the existing HARP guns were shut down. Today, the original HARP gun still sits on a hillside in Barbados, forgotten and rusting away. Number 2. Johnston Island Air Force Base in 1935, the United States Navy began preparing a coral atoll in the South Pacific for use as a military base and airport. Known as Johnston Atoll, it sits several hundred miles southwest of Hawaii. Military personnel blasted coral to make way for an airfield and installed an aircraft parking area. A causeway connected the site to Sand Island, where barracks for housing 400 men were built. In addition to its military use, the airport serviced a small number of commercial flights under Aloha Airlines and Continental Micronesia. Upon landing, military personnel surrounded the aircraft. Passengers weren't allowed to leave the plane unsupervised. During the 1960s, nuclear testing was carried out on barges full of monkeys and the island housed a chemical weapons storage facility. Not surprisingly, the area became contaminated with plutonium. Good job, humans. The airport and base were tiny, but important enough to remain in use until the site closed in 2005. For a while, it functioned as a diversion airport for emergency landings. The runway is no longer maintained, but it's considered preferable to a water landing in an extreme flight emergency. All that's left of the facility is a 9,000-foot runway and taxiway, along with a paved ramp. Number 1. RAF Upper Hayford Located in Oxfordshire, England, RAF Upper Hayford was a Royal Air Force RAF station that was built during World War I. Between then and 1950, it was primarily used as a training base. At the beginning of the Cold War, the site was transferred to the U.S. Air Force Strategic Air Command, which used it to house strategic bombers that were on temporary 90-day deployments. Starting in 1966, the base also housed United States Air Forces in Europe, USAFE, tactical reconnaissance aircraft, and in 1970, it added strike aircraft to its collection. The planes were used for patrolling the edges of the communist bloc. Wanting the property to feel more like home, the American military built a shopping mall, bowling alley, baseball diamond, pizza parlors, and donut shops at Upper Hayford. They even went as far as installing other fixtures that would make it look more like a typical U.S. suburb, including street signs and American-style fire hydrants. The population peaked during the 1970s and 80s with around 13,000 servicemen stationed at the base. Operations at Upper Hayford came to an abrupt end in 1993 after the Soviet Union fell. It's remained abandoned ever since, and its future is an ongoing topic of debate. Some want to see the site preserved as a Cold War monument, while others consider it an eyesore and simply want to see it gone. For the most part, the base is in ruins. Parts of it have been taken over by wildlife, including the disused runways. Preservation efforts are reportedly underway, and some buildings have received protected status as monuments, but the ultimate fate of Upper Hayford remains to be determined. Number 10. The World's Largest Submerged Airplane In 2016, an Airbus A300 cargo plane was deliberately sunk off the coast of Kusadisi, a city in western Turkey. The aircraft had recently retired after a 36-year career in the sky before plunging to its final resting place, where it functions as an artificial reef for marine life. Measuring 177 feet from nose to tail and with a wingspan of 144 feet, the A300 is the world's largest submerged airplane. Turkish officials made the decision to sink it in a bid to increase tourism to the region by turning it into a dive site. In the handful of years since the aircraft was relocated to its current home, it's become covered in coral and is quickly turning into a thriving aquatic habitat. Prime real estate for the fishes. For the most part, the plane was sunken in its original condition, minus several different safety measurements that were taken to eliminate any environmental hazards. And as it turns out, the move to boost tourism worked. Diving has increased noticeably in the region, presumably due to the rare and unique opportunity to see fish and other creatures living in and around a cargo plane. Number 9. Mexico's Flooded Caves 66 million years ago, a 9.3-mile-wide asteroid slammed into what is now Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, carving out a 124-mile-wide crater in the Earth's surface. It was the same catastrophic event that wiped out the dinosaurs. A mega-tsunami followed, creating thousands of limestone sinkholes in the process. Over time, these sinkholes collapsed and eroded, forming vast underwater cave networks known as cenotes. These networks seem to go on endlessly, and new discoveries are continuously being made inside them. Just a few years ago, 
ago, news headlines announced the discovery of the world's largest underwater cave within the system. It stretches on for 215 miles. In 2012, cave divers discovered a near-complete human skeleton near Tulum in a submerged cave called Chanhol. Unfortunately, by the time the marine archaeologists reached the site, most of the remains were gone. All that remained were roughly 150 bone fragments, including a pelvic bone. Luckily, the remaining bones provided experts with enough evidence to accurately determine that the person they belonged to died at least 13,000 years ago. The individual was a young man who perished before the caves were filled with water. This was just one of several fascinating discoveries that have been made within Mexico's largely unexplored cenotes. In August of 2019, a team of researchers consisting of scuba divers, archaeologists, photographers, and computer graphics experts announced plans to make 3D visuals of the insides of dozens of the caves. Known as the Wonderland Project, the images will enable people to virtually explore a region that has never been publicly accessible from the comfort of their homes. The cenotes are supposed to contain everything from fossilized bones to ancient Mayan artifacts. Most of the time, divers have left artifacts untouched to avoid disturbing sacred sites. Some objects are simply too delicate to be moved or even touched, making the Wonderland Project all the more important by preserving items that may otherwise be lost to time. Number 8. W.C. Kimball Wreck in 1891, a strong gale capsized a 40-ton wooden schooner called the W.C. Kimball in northern Lake Michigan with four people aboard. The wreck was lost until 2019. Curious divers and shipwreck hunters found the vessel 300 feet beneath the waves. They were pleasantly surprised when they realized that it's one of the most intact 19th century wooden schooners ever discovered. W.C. Kimball was built in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. She spent her entire career on Lake Michigan, according to shipwreck hunter and author Ross Richardson, who found the ship in 2018 when he noticed a small blip on his sonar while sailing across the lake. Unsure of exactly what it was, he eventually returned to the site with a technical diver and an underwater photographer. The schooner bore no identifying marks despite its pristine condition. As a result, the process of identifying the wreck was complicated and time-consuming. Richardson spent weeks poring over more than 6,000 schooner records before finally identifying W.C. Kimball as the probable candidate. Upon taking a closer look, researchers noticed that the vessel's lifeboat was still attached, indicating that the distressed crew was unable to reach for it for one reason or another. It's possible that they had already gone overboard by the time the ship sank. Number 7. Chuk Lagoon Vehicle Graveyard At the bottom of Chuk Lagoon in waters belonging to Micronesia, there's an eerie graveyard containing a World War II-era ghost fleet of Imperial Japanese ships, planes, and tanks. The vehicle sank in February 1944 during a massive air and sea attack that the U.S. Navy launched against the Japanese known as Operation Hailstorm. It saw the destruction of 270 planes and 45 marine vessels. Japan forged a friendship with Micronesia during the late 19th century when Japanese sailors were first welcomed there. After World War I, the League of Nations revoked Germany's possession of the region and handed jurisdiction over to Japan, which proceeded to turn the islands into a fortified stronghold. Today, the sunken vehicle graveyard at Chuk Lagoon, formerly known as Truk Lagoon, is a popular diving site. The most experienced explorers often spot things they've never seen before, even after making a dozen or so trips to the site. In addition to the dozens of vehicles to be found there, there's a plethora of everyday objects, including medicine bottles, plates, and shoes, as well as a myriad of military items such as battery guns, gas masks, and ammunition. Would you like to go diving and check out this haunting graveyard? Let us know in the comments down below, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 6. The Discovery That Wasn't one of the most fascinating underwater discoveries never really happened. Known as the Miskovich Emeralds hoax, it came following the onset of the Great Recession in 2008. Hoping to cash in on the value of shipwrecked gyms after plummeting into financial ruin, American diver and businessman Jay Miskovich concocted a plan to discover a 154-pound treasure trove of emeralds off the Florida coast. He carried out the deceptive scheme in 2010 by planting the gems near Key West and finding them later on. Miskovich persuaded several companies to fund an expedition to salvage the gems. In the meantime, he kept the phony discovery hidden from the public due to the confusing and controversial nature of marine salvage laws. As soon as word of the emeralds leaked, numerous experts doubted the authenticity of their finders' claims. They called for an investigation into Miskovich's credibility, noting that the site of the alleged discovery isn't connected with any known shipwrecks and that there's no evidence of one ever having occurred there. Eager to make a quick buck for themselves, several others filed lawsuits against Miskovich claiming rightful ownership of the gems. Amid the ongoing litigation, suspicions that the entire discovery was staged grew. 
Sadly, Miskovich decided he couldn't bear the weight of his problems. He committed suicide in 2013, leaving the Emeralds in a legal limbo of sorts. In other words, it was unclear who they belonged to. In 2014, experts determined that the gems are coated in a modern epoxy, debunking Miskovich's claims that they were shipwrecked treasure. With Miskovich out of the picture, the jewelry stores that sold him the uncut Emeralds bore the brunt of the blame for withholding information that would have revealed the gems' phony shipwrecked status much sooner, had they been more forthcoming. Number 5. Noxious Underwater Spring In early 2020, divers discovered a strange underwater spring off the Philippine coast. Situated 200 feet beneath the water's surface, it spewed carbon dioxide like champagne bubbles. Humans are usually to blame when it comes to unwanted emissions these days, but in this case, the cause was geological. A nearby underwater volcano was venting through open cracks in the ocean floor, causing the fizzling bubbles of CO2. Interestingly, the toxic spring was located near a thriving coral reef, prompting scientists to wonder how these systems can coexist so close to one another. Their concern is valid, especially considering how carbon dioxide is typically associated with death and destruction. The mysterious site is located in a stretch of water between the islands of Luzon and Mindoro, known as the Verde Island Passage. Known as Soda Springs, geoscientist Bayani Cardenas and his colleagues discovered it by accident while studying the effects of groundwater from nearby islands on local ecosystems. Its higher-than-average concentrations of CO2 make the site an ideal place for studying the ongoing mystery of how marine life adapts to increased carbon dioxide levels. Number 4. Nyora. The Nyora was a steam tug that sank near southeastern Australia in 1917 during a severe storm off Cape Jaffa. It began listing in heavy seas while pulling an American sailing ship called the Astoria. Nyora's crew cut the tow line in a last-ditch attempt to save both themselves and the Astoria's crew. Unfortunately, it was too late for the tugboat, which went down as waves smashed its engine room door in. Two crew members clung desperately to the top of a wrecked lifeboat and miraculously survived. Sadly, 14 others tragically succumbed to the unforgiving seas. The surviving pair managed to paddle to a lighthouse and were pulled ashore by its keepers, who braved the tempestuous sea in order to save the men's lives. They ended up receiving medals for the courageous rescue. Today, the Nyora's remains sit 164 feet below the water surface. Diver Steve Seville found the 104-year-old wreck in 2019 after researching it for several years and with the help of local fishermen. Speaking with Nine News, Seville described the historic vessel as a popular tug of Port Melbourne that helped to solve all sorts of shipping problems around Australia. Descendants of the Nyora survivors and one of the lighthouse keepers were informed of the landmark discovery. Number 3. Classic Cars If you owned or had the opportunity to drive an expensive car, the last thing you'd probably do is dump it into a river. Unless you were a getaway driver, that is. Acting on a tip from a self-proclaimed former criminal in early 2020, divers from the YouTube channel Adventure with Purpose found nine submerged vehicles near a boat launch at the bottom of the Tualatin River outside Portland, Oregon. The finds included a 1973 Ford Mustang Mach 1 and a first-generation Mazda RX-7. While most of the vehicles were beyond saving, the Mustang and the RX-7 seemed salvageable. The divers summoned a tow truck to pull the cars to dry land. Retrieving them was no easy task. The Mazda was upside down, requiring workers to flip it over before the tow truck pulled it out. And while its wheels and interior parts were all present, its roof was pushed in, the paint was peeling, and salvagers were unable to pop the hood. Getting the Mustang out of the river was even more difficult because it was stranded even further into the water. When the team tried to lift the front end using inflatable balloons, the engine ripped from the chassis. They ended up having to call a heavy-duty rig to yank the car from the muddy river bottom. The vehicle was completely rusted out, and it folded beyond recognition while it was being moved. While the plans for the Mazda are unknown, it's probably safe to say that the Mustang is as good as gone. Number 2. Ocean Atlas You can find the world's largest underwater sculpture, Ocean Atlas, at the bottom of the Caribbean Sea off the Bahamian capital of Nassau. Installed in 2014, the artwork depicts a girl carrying the weight of the ocean. It's a direct nod to the Greek myth of Atlas, who bore the weight of the world on his shoulders. Measuring 16 feet tall and weighing more than 66 tons, the massive sculpture was assembled piece by piece at its current location. The submerged statue was designed, built, and engineered by sculptor Jason DeCares Taylor. It's made from pH-neutral materials and will remain recognizable even after it's overtaken by marine life as part of an artificial reef. In addition to giving ocean creatures a desperately needed place to stay alive, Ocean Atlas helps to draw tourists away from the natural coral reefs. 
It's more important than ever to preserve these fragile habitats, which are suffering greatly from the effects of overvisiting and other human activities. As stated on Jason DeCare Taylor's website, the world's oceans and coral reefs are directly threatened by overfishing, habitat loss, ocean acidification, global warming, and water pollution. In his words, the artwork symbolizes the burden we are currently asking future generations to carry and the collective responsibility we must accept to prevent its collapse. Number one. Long Lost Long Island Shipwreck Late in the Civil War, the Confederate commerce raider vessel CSS Tallahassee collided with a ship called the Adriatic off the coast of Long Island, New York. The 181-foot-long Adriatic plunged to the bottom of the Atlantic roughly 30 miles south of Montauk Point. Divers rediscovered the wreck in early 2020, 156 years after it sank to its watery grave. Finding it was, in the words of author and former Nassau County Museum Supervisor Harrison Hunt, especially significant for Long Islanders, as it highlights how close the Civil War came to home in the form of Confederate raiders. To make up for its limited industrial resources amid the pressure to assemble a navy, the Confederacy refitted steam and sail-powered vessels with cannons and sent them after Union ships. The encounter between Tallahassee and Adriatic happened on August 12, 1864, and was the final Confederate incursion into northern waters before the war ended. Tallahassee's crew removed nearly 200 passengers from the Adriatic and burned it, sinking it 220 feet beneath the water's surface. Commercial fishers discovered the wreck in 2016 when it got in the way of their catch. They alerted Long Islander John Noonan to its presence, and he gathered a team of divers to investigate the site. After verifying its checkered past through historical records, they began a series of dives to recover what's left of the Adriatic. Number 9. Ever Prosperity there were two cargo ships called the Ever Prosperity. Known as twin ships, they were based out of the same port in Monrovia, Liberia. They may not be the most spectacular shipwrecks you've ever seen, but they do have an interesting backstory. They both wrecked on the reef coast of New Caledonia, a collection of islands in the South Pacific that belonged to France. The first ship, known as the SS Ever Prosperity, went straight up the West Coast Barrier Reef in 1965. The second Ever Prosperity met the same exact fate five years later in 1970. It hit the sea bottom just 45 miles south of the first wreck while traveling from Sydney to the New Caledonian capital of Noumea. To make matters even more mysterious, both ships were under the command of the same captain when they wrecked. At first glance, the rusting ships are nothing special to look at, but knowing the strange story behind them makes them all the more interesting and mysterious. Number 8. Abaya the Abaya was launched from Irving, New York in 1847. For the first several years, it carried grain and lumber across the Great Lakes. While traveling from Chicago to Oconto, Wisconsin in 1855, it was hit by a sudden gust of violent wind and capsized. It was overtaken by waves while being towed upside down and sank within 15 miles of the Sheboygan coast. The wreck was discovered in 2019 at the bottom of Lake Michigan, where it sits 220 feet beneath the water's surface. It remains mostly intact, according to the Wisconsin Historical Society, which recently announced that the Abaya has been added to the State Register of Historic Places. The agency said that the wreck has given experts a valuable opportunity to learn about early wooden schooner construction on the Great Lakes. As a historic place, the ship is protected by law. It's illegal for divers to remove, destroy, or otherwise interfere with artifacts at the site. Thankfully, due to its depth, it's unlikely that the wreck will receive many visitors. The Great Lakes are known for their ferocious waters, which have taken down thousands of ships over the centuries. Every year, a dangerous weather pattern called the Gales of November causes massive storms that come with 50 mile per hour winds and gusts of up to 100 miles per hour, creating the perfect conditions for sinking a ship. Many of these wrecks are still waiting to be discovered, and it's often a treat for archaeologists when a new one is found. Thanks to the dark, frigid waters they come to rest in, these ships tend to be remarkably intact for their age. Number 7. Bom Jesus Namibia's skeleton coast is famous for its unforgiving conditions, which have left the shoreline littered with hundreds of shipwrecks. While draining a man-made salt lake there in 2008, a group of miners and geologists noticed a piece of wood and metal scattered along the shore. It led them to a buried shipwreck. Experts believe that it's the Bom Jesus, a Portuguese vessel that vanished along with its crew in 1533 while sailing from Lisbon to India. It's the oldest wreck ever found in southern Africa and the first in the region to be found laden with treasure, including gold coins and more than 100 elephant tusks. 
Researchers traced the ivory to the African forest elephant, a species native to the humid forests of West Africa and the Congo Basin. Until recently, scientists believed that the African forest elephant left its native habitat for the dry savanna as recently as the early 20th century. But the 500-year-old tusks found on the Bom Jesu probably came from elephants that were killed along the coast, indicating that the species left the rainforest as early as the 16th century. The findings surprised scientists who previously thought that different elephant species generally stuck to specific regions and habitats. But the study puts the animals in a mixed environment and shows that they chose to migrate long before hunters came along and nearly drove them to extinction. While their reasons for doing so are unclear, learning more about the creature's past movement can help experts more effectively address modern-day concerns revolving around the illegal ivory trade. Number 6. Batavia the Batavia was a flagship of the Dust East India Company, a multinational corporation that once dominated world trade. During its maiden voyage to Southeast Asia in 1629, it wrecked roughly 50 miles off Australia's western coast. The ship's commander, Francisco Pelcert, went off in search of food and water, leaving 282 survivors behind on Beacon Island. He was gone for three months. During Pelcert's absence, a merchant named Geronimus Cornelis took control of the survivor colony. He ordered dozens of murders, including of women and children. His reign of terror ended when Pelcert returned and had him executed along with several other mutineers. The remaining survivors were rescued and the 150-foot-long Batavia went undiscovered until the 1960s. During excavations in the 1970s, the surviving part of the ship's stern section was raised and preserved. It's the only part of an early 17th century Dust East India Company vessel to ever be removed from the water. Records of where the timber for the ship came from are scarce, but a new study of its tree rings is shedding light on the wood's origins and age. The trees were felled around 1625 in northern Germany and the Baltic region, and the wood was processed shortly thereafter. It was still green when it was cut and used for building the Batavia. The researchers found that the shipbuilders discarded the timber's softer outer rings, or sapwood, which is more vulnerable to decay and shipworm infestation. This shows that the Batavia's builders were skilled craftsmen who had a lot of experience with the type of wood they were using. In addition to studying the ship, experts are investigating human remains that were buried on Beacon Island. Several mass graves have been discovered, amounting to 115 bodies in total. Some bore no signs of meeting a violent end, indicating that the individuals perished from dehydration. They may have gone crazy before they died. Others, namely those who were murdered by the mutineers, show signs of having suffered through horrific violence. One man's skull was partially lobbed off with a sword. The unspeakable tragedies that occurred here make for a particularly bizarre tale, even to the researchers who have long studied the signs of carnage that were left behind. Number 5. Navagio Beach Wreck On the Greek island of Zakynthos, there's a crescent-shaped beach that's only accessible by boat. Known as Navagio Beach, its focal point is the hull of a freighter that ran aground during the 1980s. The wreck sits in the pristine white sand, earning the site the nickname of Shipwreck Beach. It's also called Smuggler's Cove, owing to rumors that the freighter was used for smuggling cigarettes, wine, and other contraband. Surrounded by steep cliffs on all sides, the beach feels like a hidden getaway. But it's no well-kept secret. In fact, it was one of the most popular tourist destinations in Greece until a landslide injured seven people in 2018. After that, the Greek tourism ministry closed the beach to visitors for several obvious safety reasons. A committee was recently appointed to decide on the future of Navagio Beach, including the best ways to protect it and whether or not to open it to the public again. They're hoping to restore the wreck and to make the site safe for visitors by next summer and to reopen it in a way that enables local residents to benefit from tourism. Would you like to check out Shipwreck Beach if it reopens to the public? Let us know in the comments below, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 4. Ancient Carthaginian Galleys On March 10, 241 BC, a Roman fleet of ships destroyed a fleet of Carthaginian vessels off Sicily's northwestern coast in the Mediterranean Sea. It brought the First Punic War to an end, with Rome emerging victorious. During these types of sea battles, warships purposely crashed into each other in an effort to sink the enemy or to get close enough to board the enemy's ship and engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. To protect against damage and maximize the destruction against the enemy, ships were equipped with metal rams. Researchers have found the remains of some of the wrecked ships scattered along the seabed, where they've sat for over 2,000 years. 
A recent study found that one bronze ram was home to over 100 marine species, who repurposed the vessel for their own needs. The hollow metal piece was recovered and restored in 2017. As part of the process, the team collected and studied samples of the organisms living on it. They also examined the ram itself, which is covered with Punic inscriptions that they've failed to decipher thus far. By taking a closer look at the ancient debris as well as what's living on it, experts are learning more about the past, as well as how underwater creatures incorporate man-made objects into their natural habitat. Number 3. Jenny Lind The Jenny Lind was a small sailing ship that ran aground on a coral reef in the South Pacific in 1850 while traveling from Melbourne to Singapore. Thankfully, all 28 passengers aboard, including three children, survived the ordeal but their journey to safety was just getting started. For the next 37 days, they lived on a cay of sand while building a makeshift vessel from the wreckage of the Jenny Lynn. The group then sailed 370 miles to Morton Bay, near the Australian mainland. The wreck was still visible in 1987, according to a maritime survey that was performed that year. But archaeologists concluded in 2017 that the ocean had destroyed what was left of the ship, leaving literally nothing behind. During the expedition, the team found what was left of four other sunken vessels, including cannons, anchors, and ballast stones. They believe that the ships all sank sometime before 1850, which was around the same time that the reef began to appear on navigational charts. Located along a major trade route between Australia and Dutch and French Pacific colonies, the reef was strewn with wrecks as early as 1857, according to one historical record. So the Jenny Lynn's disappearance isn't too surprising given the area's reputation for powerful tidal currents that are known to ravage what's left of wrecked vessels. Archaeologist James Hunter told Live Science that the reef is also dangerous because it's not easy to notice at high tide, and some ships have sailed right into it at full speed. Researchers hope to identify the wrecks that they explored during the 2017 expedition, which would help them learn more about the trading history of the region's early European colonies. Number 2. San Jose. The San Jose was a Spanish galleon that wrecked off the Cartagena Colombia coast in 1708 while sailing as part of the Spanish treasure fleet. It was laden with gold, silver, and emeralds when it crossed paths with a British squadron. Gunfire erupted, and the San Jose's powder magazines exploded, causing the ship to sink with most of its crew and all of its treasure on board. Only 11 sailors survived the harrowing ordeal. The cause of the explosion is a mystery. Some experts suspect that the captain shot the powder magazines because he would have rather seen the treasure plunge to the sea floor than to let it fall into British hands. The goods that went down in the sinking are thought to be worth more than $14 billion according to modern currency values. For centuries, treasure hunters scrambled to find the wreck in hopes of cashing in on a huge fortune. In 1981, the U.S. investor-funded Sea Search Armada expedition claimed to have found the San Jose. The Colombian government was quick to establish a new law giving it exclusive rights to the treasure, and authorities banned the explorers from excavating the site. A series of court battles ensued and the wreck was ultimately declared property of the Colombian state. The Colombian Navy rediscovered the sunken ship in 2015 and the battle for rights to the hoard resumed. This time, Spain tried to claim dibs on the goods. The indigenous Cara Cara people of modern-day Bolivia, whose land the treasures were extracted from, also expressed an interest in collecting on the fortune. Sea Search Armada is also still fighting for what it believes is its rightful piece of the pie. The case is currently working its way through the Colombian Supreme Court. Number 1. SS Central America The SS Central America was a steamer that sank off the South Carolina coast during a hurricane in 1857. Nicknamed the Ship of Gold, it was en route from Panama to New York City when it went down, taking 425 people and thousands of pounds of gold with it to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. During the 1980s, treasure hunter Tommy Thompson persuaded over 150 investors to finance his hunt for the wreck. They collectively ponied up $12.7 million for the expedition. Thomas and his crew discovered the wreck 8,000 feet below the water's surface in 1988. The following year, they recovered three tons of gold coins valued at over $50 million. The team was initially awarded a 92% share of the wreck, but a slew of lawsuits followed as investors accused the explorers of cheating them out of millions. 2012, Thompson failed to appear in court. He went into hiding with his girlfriend, and for the next three years they lived at a hotel, paying their living expenses entirely in cash and keeping a low profile to avoid drawing attention to themselves. The authorities eventually caught up with the couple. Ever since, Thompson has languished in federal prison while claiming he doesn't know where the treasure is. 
Of course, the judge doesn't believe his story, but Thompson refuses to budge. He recently marked his sixth year behind bars for refusing to disclose the location of the missing coins, and he's racking up legal fines to the tune of $1,000 per day. All anyone can do now is wait patiently to see if eventually he'll crack. Thanks for watching. Which one of these abandoned shipwrecks would you be most interested in checking out? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks again and we'll see you next time for another amazing video right here on American Eye.